The Holy Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. The second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in the age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are the children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For it, to him, all of them are alive. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So Thomas asked when I would like to preach again, and I say, you tell me. Next thing I know, he suggests today, leaving me to explain Jesus' description of life and relationships in the resurrection. I mean, isn't that just typical? I mean, a Ch Chapel Hill and a Harvard guy can't handle the text. Who does he turn to? The Duke guy. Can I get an amen or a go Duke? Go Duke. <laughs> so when we're faced with a gospel selection like this one, it can be a challenge to make sense of it if we only consider it outside of the context of where and when it takes place. So let me set the stage a little bit. At the end of the previous chapter in Luke, Jesus has made his dramatic entrance into Jerusalem. So think Palm Sunday. He then goes to the temple where he drives out the money changers and the merchants selling animals to be sacrificed. Jesus begins teaching in the temple despite the fact that he has not made any friends of the priests and officials, officials who we are told kept looking for a way to kill him. Instead, the priests and scribes challenged Jesus, questioning his authority and trying to trick him into saying something treasonous about the Roman emperor where Jesus gives the famous quotation, render unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Sometimes it's nice to hear the old King James again. Now it's the Sadducees' turn to challenge Jesus. Scholars note that there's little known about the Sadducees. They're described as intellectuals aligned with the aristocratic and priestly class, kind of like Duke and Harvard. <laughs> Different from the Pharisees from whom rabbinical Judaism comes, we're told the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. Instead, they hold on to an older Jewish belief that one lives on through one's descendants. Or, at least as we see in this reading, that a man lives on through his descendants. Therefore, it's important that if a married man dies childless, his brother is obligated to marry his widow so that the deceased man's heritage can be carried forward. It's from this perspective that the Sadducees pose this contrived predicament of a dead woman 
who has been the wife of seven dead brothers. And they ask in what had to have been a very dripping and kind of sarcastic tone, so uh, in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? It's as if they're posing some perverse heavenly version of the dating game or the bachelorette where the brothers compete in heaven to take possession of the woman for eternity. And Jesus answers them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry or are given in marriage. When he speaks of this age and that age, Jesus is describing two different times of life. A time of life in the world we know, or at least the world we think we know, versus a lifetime beyond the world of human rules and understanding. A time of life where a woman is a husband's property and a vessel for carrying forward his heritage, versus a time of life where no one is ever the property of anyone. A time where we are not defined by who we are related to, except in our most fundamental relationship as children of God. Jesus said, indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. I hate to keep harping on this same point when I preach, but Jesus is pointing to who humans are. Just as all children are created in the images of their parents, humans are created in the image of God, our Creator. But there's also another current that's kind of moving along here in this chapter of Luke. There's a question of ownership. There's the parable of the vineyard owner whose son is killed by the tenants in their attempt to gain possession of the vineyard. So who does the vineyard belong to? And who inherits it? This parable is followed by the Pharisees' challenge about whether it's lawful to pay taxes to the emperor. Jesus' response, which I referred to a couple moments ago, directly challenges the Pharisees and us to discern what belongs to the government versus what belongs to God. And then we get the Sadducees asking, whose wife will the woman be? Who owns what and whom? The question just kind of keeps popping up. Maybe Jesus' point in today's gospel and the preceding parts of the chapter should cause us to stop and consider this whole question of ownership and belonging. Specifically, who do we belong to? What does it mean to own something? And then how do these issues of ownership and belonging shape our lives as Christians? Jesus has clearly answered the first question, we belong to God. To use his terms, in this age, in life as we know it now, we're defined by many things, our relationships, our family, be it good or not so good, our education, our occupation, our income, our political affiliation, our religious affiliation, it goes on and on and on. But how we are known in this life does not really define who we belong to or who we really are. These statuses don't change the foundational truth that we belong to God. Yes, I love my wife Dolores, and I want our relationship to stretch into eternity. But God doesn't see us as belonging to one another. No, we're seen as God's children, as a daughter and a son, no more, no less. When Jesus is pointing to that age, he's telling the Sadducees that our true identity and relationship will be revealed in the resurrected life. We're defined by only one relationship, and that is as children of God. So let's consider what ownership means. In our culture, a belief, and pers a belief in personal or private ownership pervades life as we know it. We build fences around our houses and communities to signify that I own this and not you. We have iron stakes in the middle of the woods around here to signify where my property begins and ends. Unfortunately, the deer don't seem to recognize those. <laughs> we have a whole system of laws and regulations governing property ownership. 
Just think of all the paperwork involved in buying a house or registering a car. You can even think of citizenship as a type of ownership. It characterizes the country you belong to and also who doesn't belong. But all of these rules and boundaries are human inventions. And this human approach to ownership, at least in our culture, largely creates a system where what we own defines and imprisons us. We become bound up by our boundaries. We end up possessed by our possessions. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray for God's kingdom to come now on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will and kingdom, which we know through the life and teachings of Jesus, demands no boundaries, physical or otherwise, no boundaries that separate us one from another. And there are no hierarchies according to which we are valued, and certainly not ranked according to our possessions. If there's one aspect of our life that Jesus challenges us on over and over again, it's not sex or believing the right thing. It's our relationship to money and our status and our stuff. He tells a potential disciple who's rich and has many possessions to give everything away in order to follow him. The poor guy goes away rather disappointed because he's captive to all he has. Getting a camel through the eye of a needle is easier than getting a rich person into heaven. I mean, have you seen a camel? Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you this, but he's talking to us. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Jesus is clearly telling us not to be defined and burdened by the transitory things of this world because those things have little to do with what God intends for us. He's telling us to break out of our paradigm that requires boundaries drawn to separate us from them, property lines that exclude others from our communities, be they secular, relig religious, or otherwise. We're told to refuse to be owned by our stuff. Jesus is constantly telling us in various ways to remember who you are, who every person is, and to remember and live according to who you really belong to. So assuming you all are still with me and accept what Jesus is telling us about ownership and belonging, we're left with a question, what do we do with this? How do we Christians live into this knowledge? As people who are this community we call church, we become the body of Christ. That phrase is not a metaphor. It's an action term. It's what we Christians are called to be and to do. We're called to be Christ's presence in the world. Christians, therefore, should be known for our Christ-like presence in every place that we find ourselves. Not only should we seek Christ in every person, but our lives should reveal Christ to the world. Like Jesus, we should treat everyone as a fellow child of God, be they your spouse, children, co-worker, political adversary, military enemy, and yes, yep, even that slow driver with out-of-state plates. <laughs> we love people from Florida. How many times do we have to hear how much time Jesus spends with the least and most despised in the world? Just last week we heard Jesus going to the tax collector's home. How many times do we have to hear these stories before we really start following in Jesus' footsteps? His answer to the Sadducees tells us that we're all related. We're all children of God. No need for DNA tests or Ancestry.com. We're all children of God, and we need to act like it. We need to follow Jesus. And remember that all we have, no matter how hard you did or didn't work to get it, is a gift and a blessing from God. We don't really own anything. We're simply borrowing it for a time. Our charity is not giving up. No, we're giving back. 
At convention yesterday, Bishop Jose said, keep in mind that what you do with your money is a theological statement. In other words, what we do with our money and our stuff speaks volumes about our faith. Or maybe it speaks volumes about our lack of faith. And maybe it speaks more than our words do. Therefore, just as God in Christ has been generous, be generous in sharing all you have. Give freely to those in need, because that's what Jesus does. And besides, they're all your relatives. Which kind of brings me to our stewardship campaign. And you're probably wondering, how did he get there? So I'm going to get personal. Hi, my name is Fred, and I'm a tither. And you say? Hi, Fred. Okay, we're going to try it again. Hi, my name is Fred, and I'm a tither. Hi, Fred. There we go. Took three services to wake up. Why do I tie to this church and support other charities? I don't give because this building requires money to pay the utility bills and perform maintenance and repairs, even though it does. And it's true, the clergy and the staff need to be paid, but that's not why I give. The music program is wonderful and it could be better with increased funding, but that's not the reason either. If those or similar reasons were the only basis for my pledging, I'd be better off joining a nice country club. Maybe I'd get a swimming pool. No, I give because I follow a giving God. A God who gave us everything. A God who gave us his son. A son who gave us his life through his death. That's a giving God. And so I give as a measure of thanksgiving for the many gifts and blessings I've received in life. I tithe because tithing challenges my sense of ownership, helping me to avoid being too connected to my stuff. Tithing also helps me to discern the difference between what I want and what I need. Survival school and war helped with that too, but I wouldn't recommend those to most people. I give because that's what following Jesus means. May your giving declare your thanks and trust in God, your Creator. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be, the Sadducees ask. We ask, who will I be in the resurrection? Will I be someone's wife or husband? Will I be a parent or a godparent? Who will count me as a friend or an enemy, as weak or powerful, rich or poor, alien or citizen, accepted or despised? Who am I? And who do I belong to? And Jesus answers, Peace be with you. You're a child of God, marked as Christ owned forever in the waters of baptism. Follow me and live my way. Amen.